Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is your second of two videos on economic and social welfare policy. This one's going to be a bit shorter than the first one because in the first one I talked about what is public policy generally. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat that in this one. And, th and then I talked in the first one about economic policy. And in this one we're just going to cover uh, social welfare policy. So this is going to be a bit shorter. Um, <clears throat> social welfare policy as we know it uh, in, in the United States and uh, can probably be traced back in large part to Jane Addams, who lived from 1860 to 1935. And I think those of us here on the UIC campus know her as the founder of Hull House uh, here in Chicago, which is actually on the UIC campus. Um, and you can actually see it. Um, and uh, she was sometimes called the mother of social work in that she was kind of the person who more or less founded the social work profession, which is now a, um, a recognized profession with academic degrees like here at UIC we give the MS, MSW degree, Master of Social Work, which is at the Jane Addams School. Our, our School of Social Welfare is named after her, <clears throat> or Social Work, I should say, our School of Social Work. Um, and she, she uh, came up with this idea that it was a good thing, it was a positive thing for many reasons, for uh, the government and also private organizations to attend to the social welfare needs of people, especially young people, but also uh, their parents. And uh, this gave rise to the whole idea of uh, this becoming a government responsibility. Eventually it evolves into more of a government responsibility. And so because of these are policies, public policies, we call them social welfare policies and sometimes called just social policies. Um, but these are programs that governments use to respond to particular problems in the lives of people that are beyond their capacity as individuals to handle. Uh, typically, these are problems that, that affect everybody or that affect large groups of people. And a lot of them just are inevitable parts of the human life cycle uh, or, or events that happen to just about all of us. You know, for example, you know, children can't take care of themselves. Someone has to take care of children, right? Well, what happens if the parents can't take care of the children? What should they do? Just die? Well, and, and so, so you can see where the, when you think about this, you say, well, wait a minute, maybe the government would, would have to be the child care um, uh, institution of last resort, you know. Not that we want the government to take over child care, but just if the parents can't, maybe the government should do something to support them. Uh, illness and injury. Well, everybody gets sick. Everybody gets injured. Everyone has to pay for it. Should the government attend to those costs or subsidize those costs or, or require that insurance companies um, who provide health insurance do it in certain ways, which is kind of what we're doing now is regulating the insurance industry. And some things are just, you know, just inevitable. Old age. You know, there's, there's childhood and there's old age. And in old age, people sometimes, almost always, eventually at some point, can't take care of themselves very well. So what should happen? You know, who, who's going to take care of them? You might say, well, preferably their family. Sure, but what if the family doesn't? Then what? And so these um, are collective problems. Many of these social conditions are viewed as collective problems that, that have impacts on the larger society. You know, and so I've listed some of the major areas here, health care, housing, education, child care, nutrition, employment. Well, these are things that are everybody's problems at one stage or another in their lives. And so we have government policies that are like safety nets. Sometimes we use the term safety net. In other words, if private resources fail, there's a government program to catch those so that they don't just become, um, just don't just suffer and die or um, live in the street or something. Now, you may say, well, I know people who live in the street. And yeah, I've, I, I'm aware they do too. But, you know, the idea here is that government should be doing something for people whose private resources completely fail them you know, due to mental illness, drug addiction, uh, poverty, unemployment, whatever it might be. So we have programs in healthcare. We have Medicare, which is a government-sponsored program to provide for health insurance uh, for, the, uh, for old people. We have the Affordable Care Act, which is for everybody else. That is a regulation of the insurance industry to make uh, uh, health insurance more affordable and, and cover more things. Housing, well, we have housing choice vouchers, uh, and in some cases, actual public housing units for people who, who can't afford housing. 
uh, education. Well, we have, of course, we have public education, Chicago public schools, etc. cetera. Uh, well, every, every, you know, the society benefits from all th these things. I mean, uh, people need to be educated as children uh, uh, so that, and actually as adults. And, and society benefits from that. So if, if people can't afford to pay for it privately, what do we do? Well, for example, for early childhood education, we have Head Start. That's a government-sponsored program to make sure that there's preschool available for kids whose parents can't afford it. What about child care? Well, who's going to care for small children if both parents have to go to work, for example? Or, one, or if they have only one parent and that parent has to go to work. Or one parent in the home and that parent has to work. We have child care tax credits that allow people... It subsidizes the cost of paying for child care for small children. Nutrition. We want people to starve. What if they can't uh, afford to pay for food and they're going to potentially starve or resort to crime to steal food? What do we do? Well, we have um, these prog programs that, you know, SNAP or whatever it's called, but basically the idea of food stamps, SNAP, meaning a government subsidy for basic food necessities for people, which, by the way, the farming industry loves because they get to sell um, more products because more people can buy it. And employment. Well, we have the thing called unemployment insurance, where um, uh, you know we, we have really uh, a government policies where full employment is considered actually a bad thing because it leads to inflation. Um, and what about the permanently unemployed or long-term unemployed? You know, people who can't who are laid off and can't find a job through no fault of their own. Unemployment insurance programs that are set up through government and paid for in part by private resources and partly by tax dollars. So these are some examples. Now, how did these become government responsibilities? Well, pretty simple. Before the Industrial Revolution, you know, and, and after that, really, many people or most people lived in small towns, rural areas, and, and they had extended families and neighborhood networks of people who supported those who couldn't take care of themselves to some extent, not in a lavish way, but, you know, uh, if, if people had to go work in the fields, there were people around, grandparents and so forth, who could take care of their kids. Well, things have changed. Uh, immigration, urbanization, people moved out of those small town networks and into cities where they did not have those supports. That's, that's what Jane Addams focused on. People flooding into the city of Chicago with no social supports to, to do these things that they had when they were in Italy or Poland or you know, uh, uh, Ireland or wherever they came from, they had these social supports and when they came here, they didn't. Uh, they couldn't supervise their children very effectively. And uh, then we have industrialization, cut people off from direct subsistence activities, growing their own food and created new risks of injury and death. Uh, so what if they can't buy food, but they're used to growing food and now they can't. So, you know, in the late 1800s, it became clear to governments all around the world that a lot of these social problems were getting worse and that government had to do something. Uh, the social and economic elites began to, and political elites began to understand that all these things, illness, injury, lack of education, bad housing, all these social problems are bad for the economy in addition to causing the personal suffering. And this is why all developed nations in the world, all of them, have social welfare policies. You know, the moral reasons... Uh, we you sometimes use the term the deserving poor. That doesn't mean they deserve to be poor. It means they deserve our support because they are poor through no fault of their own, such as children. They're called the deserving poor because the children can't help it that they're poor. They, have, they deserve help. Uh, so there's a sense of obligation. Um, and then there are pragmatic reasons. I mean, that, that deprivation and, and inequality and poverty... Um, cause terrible social tension and probably contribute to an increase in the crime rate. That's a pragmatic fact. Um, we need an educated, healthy workforce to run the economy. Uh, and then there's just electoral pressure. People get to vote, and voters demand certain social welfare programs under many conditions. Um, and even business interests, you know, for example, many business interests actually supported the uh, Affordable Care Act because they wanted something that would cut the cost of buying health insurance for their employees, which is one of the goals of uh, the Affordable Care Act. So uh, these are all pragmatic reasons. And, you know, in, in the UK, it's just an example. I've got a picture of Anurin Bevan, who is the, um, a Welsh Labour Party member of the House of Commons in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain. He was a uh, Minister of Health in the UK, and he was the main person who created the, the National Health Service in 1948, um, and he said, here's the challenge. How can wealth, meaning wealthy people, 
persuade poverty, you know, to persuade poor people, to use their political power to keep wealth and power. <laughs> so I see, he says, the art of concert, because he was a Labour Party person, he was a, the le on the left, and he said that, that what's been going on here with, with the Conservatives or the Tories is that rich people have persuaded poor people to vote to keep rich people in power. And so uh, he, the idea here is when, in the creation of the uh, National Health Service was two things. One, it created uh, affordable health care for everyone because basically they have a free National Health Service paid for through tax dollars that everyone pays. And then politically, it leads to support for the Labor Party. See, so in a way, he said this, his philosophy was, well, this is a way if we create a National Health Service that the Labor Party supports, then that induces uh, voters to support the Labor Party rather than the Conservative Party. And that is, if you think back to the objections to the Affordable Care Act, uh, many Republicans were against it because they thought that it would be such an advantage for the Democratic Party. Um, it, hard to say, really, uh, uh, whether it was or not, but that was a concern at the time. So just understand support for social welfare policies have political implications as well. And so uh, it's a source of partisan conflict. Typically, Democrats are advocating for greater expenditure for health insurance programs, subsidies, uh, support for public education, child care, um, various kinds of income support programs, food supplementation, and retirement programs like Social Security. Um, and they try to maintain these programs. That's why they want progressive taxation, where we tax the rich. And they want to spend less on the military. And so they always point to what other nations are doing, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. What do Republicans say? Oh, no. Republicans have fought against every social welfare program that has ever been created. They opposed Social Security in the 1930s. They opposed uh, uh, aid to families with dependent children, which, which um, <clears throat> was the, what we used to call welfare, meaning um, support for mothers who have children at home. They opposed that. They opposed Medicare. They opposed Medicaid. And they opposed the Affordable Care Act. They call all of these programs socialism. They always oppose them. And they always say that they want to eliminate them. And instead, they want tax cuts and they want to spend more in the military. And so, um, you know, and I'm, I, again, you know, there are, there are reasons why we might want to spend more or less on the military. There are reasons for and against, uh, you know, tax cuts. There are arguments on both sides. Um, but just understand for social welfare uh, issues, in almost all cases, this is a partisan issue, that the Democrats are usually more in support of social welfare programs uh, than Republicans, it's a, um, almost regardless of all these other issues. Now, um, let's compare ourselves to other developed nations. There are 40, oh, the, there's something called the uh, OECD, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It is basically... Uh, 40 well-developed, strong economies around the world. You can see the list of these nations. <clears throat> now, what percentage do these other nations spend on um, public and uh, on social expenditures, in other words, social welfare programs? Well, France spends 31% of their GDP. The um, average for all of 40 nations is 20% of GDP. What do we spend? 18.7%. So you see, we, we are the wealthiest nation in the world. We could spend a lot more on this, but we don't. Instead, we spend less than the average. So nations that are less wealthy than we are spend a higher percentage of their GDP on uh, social expenditures. Why is that? Well, you know, we make a distinction between those who deserve our help, the deserving poor, and those who don't, the undeserving poor. We tend to be more judgmental about, well, why are you poor, you know? Why are you poor? Maybe you're not working hard enough. Maybe you made bad decisions. You know, in European countries, they don't really worry about that so much. They figure that, you know, unemployment is not your own fault, usually. In our country, we, we, we're more judgmental about that. We have a political culture of privatism that says the private sector does things better than government. Uh, we also have more generous private charitable giving in the U.S. than most European nations do. So there is more money coming from, from um uh, wealthy people setting up foundations and, and uh, charities and so forth. Um, but, um, you know, the European nation's um, interesting aspect to it is the support for these social welfare programs in, in these countries developed during a time when they had very homogeneous populations. And uh, now that their populations, because of immigration, are much more heterogeneous, 
these social welfare programs have become a little more controversial, even in nations like Sweden, where they were basically almost a socialist country. Their um, social welfare programs have become more controversial because now there are more immigrants in their country drawing on those programs. It isn't just, quote, Swedes, as they used to be considered. Um, I mean, they are Swedes in the sense that they are citizens, but they're not of Swedish ancestry. And so even in Sweden, there's, you know, as the country became, has become more diverse, some of the policies have, be, have come under uh, some more criticism. And that is interesting, uh, but they're still far more um, well-funded than ours. Here's a key thing that you should expect to be tested on. There's two kinds of social welfare programs. Means-tested programs, which is for people below a certain income level, and social insurance programs where income or wealth is, is irrelevant and everyone who qualifies because of age or whatever gets them. It doesn't matter how much money you have. So means-tested programs, uh, what we used to call AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, now called Temporary Aid to Needy Families or TANF, that's means-tested. You, Not all um, uh, people with children qualify. You have to be poor and have children to get government assistance. Medicaid, that's for lower-income people. SSIs, food stamps. Okay, all these programs are politically unpopular with people who don't want to pay for them. You know, people say, why should we be paying for these uh, programs. They're controversial because they're only for the poor and some people don't want to help the poor. But interestingly, they are far less expensive in terms of their overall cost than the social insurance programs, which are much more popular. So what are the social insurance programs? They're for everybody. Uh, social Security. Well, once you hit 65, you're eligible for Social Security. doesn't matter if you, you could be the richest person in the country. You could be Jeff Bezos or um, um, Elon Musk. It doesn't make any difference. They're all, they're all eligible for Social Security. They're all eligible for Medicare. Again, it's just your age. These things are much more um, popular because they're for everybody. Uh, and they are enormously expensive. In other words, you know, Social Security and Medicare are very expensive programs, and they're going to get more expensive because of the aging of the baby boom generation, which is in their 60s and 70s now. Um, and they're funded by you know, regressive payroll taxes, uh, which are a flat rate of 6.2%. And, you know, that means even the richest people in the country are paying the same tax rate. Progressive would mean the richer you are, the more you'd pay, which we could do, but we, we don't. These, these are funded by a flat uh, tax. Now, we use the term poverty. What does poverty mean? I'm going to show you. This is the, we, we have quantified that. Every year it changes a little bit, but this is basically what it is. Um, to be poor in the 48 contiguous states. Alaska's, it's different in Alaska. It's, it has to be, everything's more expensive in Alaska, but the 48 contiguous states in the district, and, and also Hawaii, uh, but the 48 contiguous states and the D.C., one person, to be considered poor, you'd have to make less than $13,590 a year. Now imagine that. Imagine trying to live on that income. It's inconceivable, isn't it? Um, two people, 18310 what if we have like a couple, two people, and a child, household of three, 23,000. Now, just, just, just imagine for a second, if you're making more than 23, making $24,000 a year, three people, you're not considered poor. Really? I think about that. So uh, these, these standards are kind of shocking when you, when you read them, but uh, I mean, how poor you have to be to be considered officially poor. Um, but what does that mean? Given those extremely harsh numbers, how many people are poor? Well, um, I've got some I got some numbers here to show you. But basically, you know, 12, 13 percent typically of the population, maybe as high as 14 percent. It varies from year to year is considered poor. Uh, but that's a lot of people. You know, that's that's, you know, um, 40 million people. Um, and it, uh, it's disproportionately people who are um young, African-American, and Hispanic. And we have data now, I, this is some brand new data, uh, from most, most recent from the 2020 census. Uh, it's, the official poverty was 11.4, which is up from 10 and a half. Um, it had been going down for a while, because I showed you some older data, and I have some newer data. It's against 37 million people. Again, higher for non-Hispanic, uh, uh, higher for uh, Hispanic and black Americans, uh, up to 17 to 19 percent, versus only 8.2 percent for non-Hispanic white people. So it's 
uh, varies by race. And also, uh, there are more young people who are poor, 16%. That's twice the average for the whole country, right? I mean, uh, three percentage points higher than the, the whole country. And, um, and also for uh, different types of families, families with a female householder, 23.4%. That's quite high. You know, that's, that's twice the um, national average. So you see poverty is not um, evenly distributed across the country. Um, and then I, I just wanted to call to your attention. <clears throat> this, is, uh, it, this is attempted attempting to show you, even though we're not going to go through all the details of all these programs that exist, but just understand that they've actually worked. Um, this goes from the 1950s, 1959, through the 2017. Again, the gray lines are recessions. The gray vertical lines are recessions. And you can see what happens to the number of people in poverty. Uh, it tends to go down during boom periods. Then you hit the recessions, and it tends to go up. And um, the percentage of people in poverty, so first we have the number, then we have the poverty rate. And you can see that when, let me call, call your attention back to the area 1959 through the, the mid 70s, this real turning point in our society where we hit this neoliberal era. You see how the poverty rate, the red line, went down, down, down. Why did it go down? It went down part because of economic growth and in part because of the introduction of many new poverty programs in the 1960s during the so called War on Poverty, started well, under uh, President Kennedy and then in a big way under President Johnson. And it didn't start going up again until Republicans took over the White House in 1980, and then the poverty rate started going up. But it's, it's still, um, overall, with the ex existence of these programs that went into effect in the 60s, it never went back up where it was. So we end up with these poverty rates of in the 10 to 12 percent range, as opposed to the 20 percent plus range. And it's in large part because of anti-poverty programs, social welfare programs, that um, have, have reduced the poverty rate in the country apparently, permanently. Um, you can also see that it's concentrated. See the darker, this is from the census also, the darker the purple, the higher the rate of poverty. Now you can see if you look at this, that, that poverty is regionally concentrated. There is more poverty in the South. There is also a, a lot of the area you see out in the West and up in the Dakotas, those dark purples, those are... Um, those are reservation lands with the Native American tribal land in, in reservations where poverty is very high. Um, and also along the, the border, you see some border areas along the Mexican border was a lot of poverty. There's a lot of poverty in the deep south. Much of it is rural uh, poverty. Uh, in the big cities of the north, the west, and so forth, uh, Chicago, you see the poverty rates are lower. Uh, there is more, and I mentioned that the cities became the focus of poverty programs. And these, these programs have lifted many people out of poverty or at least ameliorated or reduced the worst effects of poverty. Now I've got a, just a few slides here for you about healthcare and retirement. Look over on the left. This is, this is, uh, these are the social insurance programs. These are the ones that are not means tested. These are the programs that go for everybody over a certain age, many of them. And then in the case of the Affordable Care Act, it covers everybody. Now, you can see the blue line on the left, those bars, are um, the number of people who are have no health insurance. And you can see that um, up to the, you see we're in 2010, that was when the Affordable Care Act was passed. And you see it was going up and up and up and up until I passed the Affordable Care Act. We were up to almost 50 million people who didn't have health insurance. In a country that only has like 330 million. This is a lot of people with no health insurance. And by the way, that is unheard of in other countries, other developed countries. Unheard of. It doesn't happen. And then the Affordable Care Act was passed and it went into effect. And you can see that the number of uninsured people in this country dropped precipitously down to lower, fewer than 30 million. And guess what? It's starting to climb back up again. Why? Because Republicans during the Trump administration made efforts to undermine the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and in a number of states, a number of states challenged the Affordable Care Act provisions in, um, in the courts. And ultimately, the Supreme Court uh, it supported most of the Affordable Care Act, but some parts of it were, were cut back. And so it's been possible. Now the, we see the number of uh, uninsured going up again. This is a real problem because 
um, you may say, well, that's too bad for them. Why, they should have bought health insurance. Well, they, they can't afford it. And uh, the Affordable Care Act is an attempt to reduce the cost of health insurance, among other things, so that people can afford it. But, you know, the, um, uh, if, if you don't get universal coverage, which we don't have, unfortunately, then um, what happens to people when they get really sick? Well, they go to the hospital and they run up huge bills in the emergency room and elsewhere. The hospitals are required to treat them by law and then they can't pay the bills. And what happens when they can't pay the bills? Well, that means that the hospitals are not going to eat that. They are not going to take that as a loss. They raise the cost of all the services they provide to people who do have insurance. That's why medical care costs so much in this country, because we are paying for the people who don't have insurance, and we're not going to pay anything for it. But the, when they're very sick, they're going to have to get treated. When they have to go in and have a baby, or they've broken a leg, or they need emergency surgery, or they're going to die... We don't let them die. The hospitals are required to treat them in these emergency situations. And the, if they can't pay for it, um, the hospital is not going to just go on, out of business. The hospital raises all their costs, all their charges. And so the people who can pay are paying more because we are paying for the cost of the people who don't have health insurance. And that was why the whole point of the Affordable Care Act was to make sure everyone got covered, the Supreme Court and, and Republican governors, etc., and members of Congress have fought against universal coverage. It's complicated to explain, but they managed to undermine that part of it. And so, you know, we have a patchwork quilt here that is better than it was before the ACA was passed, but we still don't have universal coverage. Uh, we have a system, um, a very unusual system. We are the only nation in the world the only developed nation, that allows private, for-profit health insurance companies to be the major provider of basic health insurance. There's no other country on earth that does that. Um, this system started around World War II. Uh, it's a complicated historical story. It just happened. I don't expect you to know all about it, but I just understand it's true. Most of us are on private insurance provided by employers. This is a totally bizarre way to do this. It's an employment benefit. Other countries don't do it this way. Uh, we do, and it's horrifically expensive. It costs us twice as much as it costs everybody else, as I'll show you in a minute. So some people have private insurance, most of us. Some people have Medicare or Medicaid because of their age or poverty. Um, that They are paid for through taxation, and that is the way most countries do it. Most countries provide for health care through taxation. We do provide some of it through taxation, through like Medicare and Medicaid, but and the Veterans Administration hospitals, but most of us are on private insurance that we obtain through our employers, and this is very costly. So as you can see, 48% of us are getting health care from our employer, 15% Medicare, 15% Medicaid, uh, and 15% of us are uninsured. So a little distinction here in terminology, health care is what, it, what we need from doctors. All right. Health insurance is how to pay for it. So private health insurance is what we get through employers. Medicare and Medicaid are government health insurance programs. Now, I'm going to promise to show you this comparatively speaking. Um, the U.S. spends way more every year on health care, that is the actual costs of what we pay to doctors and hospitals, than any other nation. $10,000 per person per year. We are the only developed nation that does not have some kind of government guaranteed universal health care. The only one. And we are the one that pays twice as much as everybody else. There it is. You see us over here? I circled it in red. $10,000 per person per year for health care. Look where the UK is with their National Health Service that I showed you earlier. $4,000 per year. They're paying through taxation. They pay taxes equivalent average $4,000 per year. That's all they pay. Then they go to the hospital. They don't have to pay. We pay uh, private health insurance companies, and I told you the problem of the uninsured, which leads to our health care costs going up for those who are insured, and so we pay twice as much as everybody else, almost everybody else. And, uh, you know, this is the situation that Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act was intended to try to fix, and uh, it is a very hotly contested issue for four years when Trump was president. He and the Republicans said they were going to repeal it entirely, uh, which would have led, you know, would, would lead, if it happens ultimately, to uh, a vast increase in the number of uninsured people, <clears throat> which in turn is going to lead to increased health care costs. 
So this is a summary of the, of the Affordable Care Act, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It was an effort to address the high cost of health care and the high number of people with no health insurance. Uh, so Republicans want to repeal it. Um, you know, they got it down, they say, as low as 20 million. The numbers I showed you earlier were 30, but understand, I don't, I'm not going to hold you to the numbers, but understand it cut the number of um, uninsured people in just about in half, but it started going back up again. It did not change the system of private insurance. It is not, despite what you may have heard on Fox News, it is not a regulation of the medical profession. It is a regulation of the insurance industry. They don't do anything to doctors. They don't do anything to hospitals. It did not change the system of private insurance. Uh, it is a regulation of private insurance companies, basically. It re made them, for example, provide insurance uh, to children. All policies, all private insurance, health insurance policies have to cover people's children through age 26. All insurance companies, all insurance policies have to cover pre-existing conditions. See, it used to be if you changed jobs, you lost your health insurance for your existing conditions. You'd change employers and they'd say, oh, well, you have a heart trouble. We're not going to pay for any of that because, you know, that's your previous insurance company. You're coming to us. You already have the problem. We're not going to pay for it. And now they have to. So now you can change jobs without losing coverage for your health care. That's Affordable Care Act. If that's repealed, then we all lose our coverage for our pre-existing conditions and we change jobs or change policies and we lose our health insurance for the condition that we really need it for. The law expanded Medicaid, but Republican governors uh, fought to prevent that expansion of coverage for their residents. So in Texas and Florida, a number of other states had Republican governors. This didn't happen. And that's one reason why they weren't able to cover as many people as they wanted. Medicaid would have been expanded. They were basically going to raise the income level so that people who work at Walmart and don't have health insurance would have qualified for Medicaid. But now, in, and they do in Illinois, but in other states they don't. Um, and it taxed the top 1% of the income to pay for subsidies so that people of lower income could buy health insurance. See, it was a redistributive program. And of course, you know, Republicans hate that because they, they don't want to, they don't want rich people to pay taxes. Um, and so this is a controversial issue. Um, two more quick slides here. Uh, just thinking about the future of this issue. The baby boom generation, which is people born from basically 1946 to um, 1965, generally speaking, it's the largest generation in US history. And they all move or moved and move into Social Security and Medicare between 2011 and 2026. This enormous number of people. Um, and then we other have that going on, but we also have increasingly expensive medical treatments, new treatments and new drugs that cost a lot of money but save people's lives and get them walking. Hip replacements, uh, heart transplants, and all these things, and very expensive drugs. But the drugs really improve people's quality of life, and the surgery gets them up and moving, makes them live longer. So that's good, but it's expensive. So the biggest generation is going on to public assistance for the rest of their lives. Uh, old people have the highest voter turnout. So their political power will increase. You know, more old people, more they have the highest voter turnout. Remember that when we talked about that? So that could make it almost impossible to cut their benefits. And so that means that the payroll taxes that we currently use to fund Medicare and Social Security might have to be greatly increased. Remember their flat taxes? But what would happen if we made those progressive? What if we increased taxes on the rich? What if we increased payroll taxes, meaning Social Security tax and Medicare tax on the rich people? Oh, well, what about that? We could do that. <clears throat> um, there, in other words, this sounds catastrophic. It sounds like we're headed for disaster. But what I'm saying is, even though this is the last slide, uh, projections of present trends into the future usually turn out to be wrong because usually we react to them. And uh, remember, there's this movie, Don't Look Up, about, you know, <laughs> comet or asteroid meteors and whatnot hitting the Earth. Um, these unforeseen events are, um, can be good or they can be bad. And I've, I'm trying to be humorous about this, but people who predict that the Social Security Trust Fund will go bankrupt or will all have to pay a fortune to support Medicare, that, understand things change. And... We use projections to steer public policy, but there's a difference between a projection and a prediction. We don't really know what's going to happen. And normally, um, 
when we when you project something far enough ahead and say, well, there'll be a catastrophe, usually before there's a catastrophe, we act. And that's what I think is likely is to happen with Social Security and, and Medicare is that there will be additional public policy steps in the social uh, in the social insurance front. Uh, on means tested programs, the same thing. There are uh, political changes that take place in Washington at the state level and so forth and in the business world and the economy. And usually we adapt to these things. So I don't want to leave you thinking we're headed for a catastrophe. We aren't necessarily. We usually avoid catastrophe. And that is what I certainly think is probably going to happen in the years to come as you get into the world and into the economy. So that concludes our second presentation of two on economic and social welfare policy. Thank you.